Fraud is a big problem with credit cards and email scams and phone scams, but did you know that fraud can also happen with e-transfers? I've got a first-time guest who's going to tell us how to protect ourselves starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. March is Fraud Prevention Month, and it's a good reminder about how fraud can happen when you share your PIN to your credit card or you click on a link in an email. But there's another area that fraudsters are exploiting, and it's through e-transfers. Since the pandemic started in 2020, we've all been doing a lot more electronic transactions. We don't send checks to our landlord. We pay by e-transfer now. Grandma doesn't send us cash for our birthday. She sends an e-transfer. We're using technology more, but that raises the risk of fraud if we're not familiar with what we're doing. So, how can you protect yourself? I've got an expert to give her thoughts, so let's get started. Who are you and what do you do? Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me. My name is Rachel Jadikar. I'm the Director of Fraud Mitigation and Strategy at Interact. So, tell me what Interact is. So Interact is the company that offers the services of debit, e-transfer, Interact Online, amongst several other products. So you might be familiar with going to the bank machine and and taking out cash or just paying by debit, using your flash card, uh, sending money, as you mentioned, grandma sending money to their grandkids. You know, that is all the Interact service. And Interact is used by all of the banks. Is that correct? So it's a, it's kind of a layer on top of the banking system that everyone can use to talk to each other. That's what, what Interact is all about. Yes, we connect over 300 financial institutions so that you and I and other people can have access to their money. Cool. Okay, so... Simple enough. We all know what that is. It's on my debit card. I got the little interact symbol. So we've all heard of it before. So what's the problem? This doesn't seem like there's much of a show here. I mean, I go and I use my card and it put, takes the money out of my bank. And, you know, so long as no one knows my pin or steals my card, I'm good. What's the problem when it comes to e-transfers then? Because again, grandma sends me money. She gives me the security question, you know, uh, you know, whatever the question is, I answer, the money's in my bank account. So what's the problem? What, why are we having this conversation? And I understand it's fraud prevention month here in March, so there must be some fraud aspect to it. Tell me what's the biggest problem? What should we be worried about? Well, you have to understand that, you know, with the pandemic, and we're going into the second year of the pandemic, we are more reliant than ever in transacting online. So that includes spending time online to work remotely, learning virtually, and also to send money to buy goods or just pay back some some individuals. You have to take a step back also and look at the mechanics of e-transfer. So when you're sending money to someone, you're not actually sending cash through email or through text. What you're doing is that you're sending the notification. And then, so that, that removes the confusion a bit that someone can just steal your money. Uh, so, so then when you're talking about, you know, what can we do to prevent ourselves? What's the type of frauds out there? Uh, well, criminals are opportunistic. And because we're more reliant of online transactions, criminals do know that as well. And then we've become complacent. We are spending so much time on our computer with information coming at us all different ways that we're just on autopilot. We just start clicking and we scrutinize less. So this is where criminals are coming in and they're taking advantage of that because now they're sending you emails trying to get you to click on a link or share information, or maybe because you have more passwords than ever, you're starting to simplify those passwords. So to give you an example of, of one type of fraud, it, it would be an email account compromise. And that's where you're sending an email to an e-transfer to someone, and then unbeknownst to you, the criminal has access to your email account because they were able to guess the password or buy the password online. And that means that they will know when you receive an e-transfer. And then they will click on the link and try to deposit the money. So, okay. I've already figured out one way to avoid this fraud problem, and that's don't have my email compromised. So I guess I should have, you know, a secure email password and, and whatnot. But how else can I protect myself then? So I, I get what you're saying. Someone has access to my email. 
the link comes in, the, the email comes in from grandma saying, hey, here's the money that I'm sending you for your birthday. If anyone else can click on that link, then that takes them to my bank, I guess, or whatever bank it's I'm banking at. But they have to put in the password too. So, right, so when you click on the link, it doesn't take you to your bank automatically. It, it gives you an option of where to deposit the funds. So that criminal wouldn't have access necessarily to your bank account unless they have your banking credentials. But it's so much more difficult to get access to online banking because there's multiple authentication factors that they have to go through versus in many email accounts, often it's just a password. So that's why they're targeting that that sector. And then when it comes to depositing the funds, the criminal just chooses one of the bank accounts that they have, and then they are prompted to answer the security question that was set up by the sending person. And this is where it's really important. We're seeing in the majority of the cases where there is an email account compromised, it's because the password is easily guessable. And I'll give you an example of the ones I've seen recently. It's what color of are my eyes? Usually you have three guesses. You know, the odds of me landing on the right one is pretty high. And then you have a lot of people that are posting online information. They're posting pictures, so that would be easy to see what color the eyes. Uh, they're, they're celebrating their, their birthday, so then you get to see when their date of birth is, or you can at least guess. Um, there is, there's so much information that we're putting out there that to social engineer and create a profile of an individual is actually easy for criminals. So I get it. There's a couple of issues here then. The first issue is if I intercept the email, I click on the link, it says, hey, what bank would you like to put this in? So I don't need to know anything about your banking information. I've got my own bank account. I say, hey, I'm going to deposit it in my own bank. And then it says, oh, you got to answer the security question. What color are my eyes? Well, okay, if I look at it statistically, uh, most people have either brown eyes or blue eyes. And if I've got three choices, I got a pretty good shot at nailing it, I guess. So I would assume the obvious protection there is really complicated security password. Is that correct? Yeah, do, do a complicated security password, but also... Make sure that if it's too complicated, that if you're sending it by email, which is the same method that you're sending the e-transfer, well, if the criminal has access to your email, they're going to get the email with the answer as well. So what I suggest is that use a different communication channel to share that password. So maybe, I know it's been a while, but pick up the phone and just call mom and say, mom, I just sent you the money or the other way around and just go, here's the password. Let's, let's deposit the funds together. And then the other option is that. In so wait, wait a minute, the, the, oh, the telephone, the telephone, I'm not familiar with this. So this is what, Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Okay. So I, I'm not familiar <laughs> with that. And, and anybody under the age of 20 listening to this will not know what you're talking about, but it's a method of voice communications. Okay. So that, that's a pretty good idea then. So call mom and say, here is the, the password I've, I've selected. Um, sorry, continue. So that would be a good way to do it. Use a different channel. Exactly. So text, you know, if you're sending an e-transfer by email, you send a text. And then the other option, which I prefer, and that, that's if uh, your financial institution offers it, is auto-deposit. So auto-deposit removes the option of the security question and answer by pre-authenticating that every time money is being sent to Rachel at Interact, it will be deposited in a specific account. So it removes the the need for you to go click on the notification link to deposit the funds and then answer the security question and answer. It just sends you an email saying, this person sent you money, it was deposited into your account, and that's all you need to know. So how do I set that up? So you go to your financial institution's online banking for those that offer it, and then you just, there's a couple of clicks and then authentication through there, and that is it. And is that tied to my email? Correct. So I go so into my online bank, bank and I say, if anyone sends me money, or it sends a link to this email, then I want you to automatically put it in my checking account, my savings account, whatever I whatever I want to do. So that Correct. sounds pretty simple to me. That doesn't sound complicated. Um, 
Now, you said not all financial institutions offer that, but most of them do. Correct. Okay. So check with your financial institution. If they don't offer it, then come on, like get in the, get in the year 2000 here. This is, this is not hard. Now, I'm trying to pick holes in your argument here. So I've set up auto deposit. Um, what can go wrong here? I mean, I guess what could go wrong is somebody who I don't know sends me money. That would be great. Should I worry about that? Um, sadly, it has never happened to me. Yeah, me neither. It is, me neither. It's, it's a good point, though. So if you are going to send money to someone, you have to ensure that you have the right email address because these are what we call irrevocable funds once they're deposited. So if, if you do send money to someone and you've got the wrong email address and the funds are deposited, now definitely go to your financial institution and explain the situation and, and you know, they will take it from there. But really, if you have second thoughts or you're not sure about where you're sending the money because you don't know the person and you're interacting online, then, you know, keep in mind that once those funds are deposited, you can't take them back. It's the same as putting cash in the mail and the, you know, the post office picked it up and sent it. It's, you can't get that back. So be absolutely sure that you want to send the money to that individual and also ensure that you have the right phone number or the right email address. Would there be any advantage to me setting up a separate email address just for Interact e-transfer purposes. So I've got my main email address, which everyone knows it's all over the internet, but I've got a separate one that I give to grandma and I say, here you go. This is the one that you can send money to. You're not actually sending money, grandma. You're sending me a link, but we can explain that to her. Um, and then that's the one I link to my bank or is that, is there no point to that? I think it depends how you interact online. So maybe for those that do a lot of online marketplace where they sell things and they want to remain somewhat anonymous um, and their email address is their full name and they they don't want to share that, then sure, you can set up uh, like a, a fictitious name or or just kind of a, um, a tag that... Uh, that, that you link to an email and then that is deposited into the account. You can absolutely do that. But you can only have one email address for auto deposit that is linked to a bank account. Ah, I got you. Okay. So I can't have 12 different email addresses unless I've got 12 different bank accounts. Correct. So, okay. So that's some pretty good practical advice because, you know, I was not aware of the whole, I mean, I've heard of auto deposit. I, you know, I, I get it, but it didn't occur to me what the, what the real purpose of it is. So it is actually a fraud mitigation strategy. Now, let me ask you another question. And that is, what is a bad deposit transfer? So I'm assuming <laughs> that's a bad deposit. So, cause I'm trying to think of all the different ways to commit fraud here. Okay. That's what I'm, I'm sitting here doing. So if I go to my bank and I put an empty envelope in the machine and I deposit a million dollars and then I immediately e-transfer that to you while there's no money in my account, the bank's eventually going to, going to find out I'm, you know, it's going to bounce at my end. Does that get you into any trouble at the other end? Is there a, a problem with you accepting that deposit? Um, no. So it goes back to that's good funds. So in the case of having a bad check or the check bounces later on, uh, that is not, that's an issue with the person who, who deposited the check. But anytime the funds go out, they are good funds. And then you, even if the check bounces, it's not like the e-transfer will be taken out of the recipient's account. Gotcha. Okay. What, I, what, what it does sound like, however, is that in certain cases, you'll have a, a type of scam. And this is kind of related a bit uh, for the job scam or an online marketplace scam. So you're selling a $50 item and the person says, I want to buy it. You know what? I'm going to send you a check. And then you receive the check and it turns out you go, Doug, you sent me a $550 check. It was only a $50 item. And of course the criminal will go, oh, I'm sorry, my fault. You know what? Just send me an e-transfer or wire me the $500 because I made a mistake. And then you'll say, oh, okay, no problem. You deposit the check, you wait two days, seems okay. And then you send the $500 by e-transfer. Well, a week later, the check bounces. 
So that means you're now out of the $500 plus the $50 item. So there is that kind of scam that might happen. We haven't seen it in, in some time, but that could be uh, the, the, the type of scam that you're referring to. Yeah, and that's not a scam specific to Interact because I could have done that same scam 20 years ago. I send you the 550 and say, oh, sorry, I sent you too much. Just send me a, a check back. Well, if you know, cross is in the mail, I get your check deposited, there's money in your account, then I can, I can be uh, taking advantage. So obviously know who you're dealing with, I think, is a, is a pretty, uh, pretty good piece of advice. Now, you mentioned job scams. What are you talking about? I don't understand what job scams have to do with e-transfers. Well, it's um, as you're aware, it's there's the unemployment rate is quite high right now. So of course, people are looking online for for employment, and uh, and there's a lot of ads out there now. Many of them are not legitimate. So I've seen recently a posting on LinkedIn. Someone applied for their job. It seemed to be a reputable company. It's actually a company that the majority of us Canadians know. And then the individual thought he was actually interviewing for a real job. And because we're all working remotely, those work from home jobs are actually real now. So he gave all his personal information, of course, to get the payroll role going. But also the company said, well, you need a printer now and you need all this office equipment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a check. You're going, to you're going to deposit that check and then you're going to go buy this specific printer and this other equipment from this company and you're going to pay them with the new transfer. So, hmm. Who could be a bit suspicious? I think it's suspicious, but to someone who, you know, might, might be in dire need of, of employment. So yeah, sounds good. Reputable company. I did an interview, met the HR manager, and then they send a transfer to buy the office equipment. And it turns out it's just, it's just a scam, right? There's no job, the check bounce, and you just lost this money. So that's one type of job scam. But then there's another type, which is where you're hired to receive money. So you're basically accounts payable and you receive payment from all these companies. You put it in your bank account and then you resend the funds through a different channel. So in essence, you're being a mule for criminals that are stealing money from other individuals and, and you don't know it, or maybe you do, but you're getting paid to do it and you're weighing in the risk. So you have to be mindful of that because there are a lot of opportunities out there that criminals are taking advantage of to use individuals that, you know, might be in a difficult situation and are looking for employment. Wow. And that sounds like a fairly easy scam to set up because if I've got a webcam and a microphone and I use Zoom, I can create the virtual background that has the logo of the company yeah. on it. You know, I guess I can create an email that looks very similar to a company email. I can put up a ad on LinkedIn. How do you know that I am actually with the company? Like that's that's a, a really tricky one. So I guess you've really got to do a bit of research. So, okay, well, maybe I'm going to phone back the company and ask to speak to Fred, the HR manager, and see if he's actually working there. Um, and then I guess you got to also be a bit suspicious. So, Fred, you're going to send me a check, and then I'm going to make an e-transfer to buy the printer and everything I need. Why aren't you guys just buying the printer? Like, wh why all these why all these intermediaries? So. So that's very interesting. And you're right. That is a an excellent scam for the pandemic times because we're all working from home and we we all want a job. Now, the other thing we all want at home is a puppy, I'm told. Now, again, I have no idea what this has to do with Interac and e-transfers, but I'm told that puppy scams are a big thing. Can you please explain to me puppy scams? Yes. Yeah, so I think what's happening. So, you know, we're in day, two, not day two, but year two of the pandemic. We are isolated. Uh, we're stressed. There's a lot that's happening and we're at home and, and many of us can be at home alone. We don't, we're not close to our family. We can't go out and interact. So there's that feeling of isolation and, and some individual wants to maybe fill that void. Uh, so you go online and, uh, and right now it's really difficult to, to find a companion, a furry companion, because they're all sold. 
But it's also easy for criminals to, to look at that opportunity and go, I could just pretend that I have a puppy for sale and I'll put it online. I'll find some really nice pictures on Google. I'll post it there and we'll see what happens. So there, there's some people that, you know, kind of interact with, with the seller. And this, again, it's all virtual. So it's really difficult to, to legitimize if it's really uh, a, a, a scam or if it's not. So you see that they're like, well, if you're really interested, I need you to send me a deposit on it. And then once, once he's old enough uh, the, for me to, to, to give you a puppy, then you can finalize excuse me, you can finalize the payment. So, okay, so I've noticed, which I, I don't have a pet, but uh, puppies go in the thousands of dollars right now. So if you give a deposit of a $1,000, and and this is not just a one-time scam, you're going to get several inquiries about this puppy because they're in high demand. So, so a criminal that's just making a, a false uh, advertisement might get 10 people sending deposits of a thousand dollars and then they never have to they will never meet this individual they might not know who this individual is and then you just take the ad down and then post it you know a different ad at, at, at a different time so it's again going back to buyers beware there's a puppy am i going to see this puppy is it a reputable breeder or is it just an individual that's selling uh, an animal, like you really have to do your research. And usually if this, this person has already done the scam, you'll see online that people are complaining about it. So I think you have to, unfortunately, we can't meet face to face, but maybe somehow uh, try to, to validate that this, this ad is real as opposed to just kind of a scam. Wow. And I guess that would work with pretty much anything I'm selling. You know, it's, uh, Absolutely. you know, I need a deposit, send it to me and then I'll send you the stuff. And I guess if it's a $10 deposit I'm sending, no big deal, but it gets, it gets bigger than it's, uh, there's not much I can do. Now, is there anything I can do after I've gotten scammed? So I've sent the money. Is there anything I can do or is the money gone at that point? Well, there's always something you can do. So one of the first thing is that if you realize you're part of the scam, so make sure that you advise your financial institution. And then I would suggest that you report it to the police as well. And then the police can conduct an, an investigation. But I just want to go back to the first point of vulnerability is really the individual. This is where you have to take a step back and just stop and just kind of scrutinize. Right? What are the odds of this? I can't find a puppy anywhere, yet this one is available. Is that legitimate? Or someone is, is sending me money through an e-transfer that I've never met, or I know the person, but they don't owe me money. How often does it happen that someone is sending you money just unexpectedly? So you have to really stop and think about it because just back in December, we had 77 uh, million e-transfer transactions that occurred. So obviously people are using e-transfer more and more and criminals see this as an opportunity to scam people and they can make money out of it. But take a step back. If it does happen, call your bank, change your online banking password right away. Change your password on the other type. So if it was an email account compromise, go change your password. Make it for a passphrase. No longer are, you know, eight criteria enough. You need to put characters, you know, capital. You need to put numbers. It's you have to have a, you know, a passphrase for, for a password. And also many accounts out there for emails offer dual authentication. So for mine, and ask me for a password. Then it sends me a notification that I have to approve on my phone. And often I also have to do the fingerprint. So that's a that's much harder to, to, to breach than just a password. And then notify law enforcement because law enforcement in some case might investigate. Most likely you're not the only victim of this scam. So they'll be able to trace back the money uh, and will assist with the investigation. Yeah, and I guess the problem is the way you described the puppy scam, I put the deposit down today and then we're going to talk again in a month. I'll tell you if the puppy's old enough and they'll need another deposit or whatever. 
Well, by the time I realize I'm getting scammed, a couple of months might have gone by. So it's kind of hard to phone up my bank and say, hey, can you reverse that transaction? Because it was two months ago. I mean, I know if if my credit card gets stolen, well, I, if I find out, I call the bank, they can put a freeze on stuff that happened in the last 24 hours. Kind of hard to freeze something from three months ago, I'm assuming, right? But it's also, you're not dealing with a merchant. This is just a person. So you're doing a person to person transfer. And that going back to, it's like real cash. It really is cash, except that, you know, you don't have the paper in your hand. So once you give that money and it's deposited in that person's account, you can't say, you know what? I never got the puppy. So I want my money back. You can't go to your bank and do that. You would have to go to that person. So this is where it's like really important to make sure you know who you're dealing with. And if you're not sure, then don't send the funds. Yeah, it's just like if I give 20 bucks to my next door neighbor, I can't go to my bank and say, hey, I want you to get my 20 bucks back. Well, it's cash. It's it's already gone. So, okay, well, these are very interesting things that I had never considered before. So I'm glad that, that we had you on. So let's finish up then with your practical advice. So you've already said make your security passwords a little bit more robust than what we're using. The color of my eyes is probably not uh, not suitable. Um, you are a big believer in auto deposit. So turn Absolutely. that on because then you don't have to worry about security phrases. The money automatically gets dumped into your bank account. What are the other practical things that people listening or watching to this right now should go out and do? Don't click on unknown links. I know there's been an increase of phishing attempts. And that's where criminals are sending you emails and trying to entice you to click on the link to provide personal information or to download malicious malware on your computer. So if it says, and I get these daily, Amazon can't deliver your package because they need additional information. Um, There's the one where a hydro is going, they didn't receive your payment, they're gonna cut your hydro off or you've overpaid a bill and we want to reimburse you. So, you know, these are all things that you got to stop and think. It is not the end of the world. The CRA is not, does not have a warrant for your arrest because you didn't pay your taxes. You got to just stop. And if it is true, don't use the link that they give you. Go to the actual source. So if it's hydro and you haven't paid or you've overpaid, usually when you've overpaid, they just put it towards your next bill. But if you're still uncertain, just log in using the original link. So just go straight to the source, log in, and look at it there. Because they there's so much coming at you, as I mentioned before. Yeah, and I think, it's easy to just click. Yeah, that, and I think that's the, the right answer. If someone emails you to say your bank account has been hacked, well, okay, why don't I log into my bank account then and see? Why don't I call right. the bank and find out? Why don't I go to Hydro, lo- log into Hydro? not using the link they sent me in the email. I already know how to log into my bank. I know how to log into Amazon or Hydro or whatever, go directly there. And and I guess ultimately you got to be skeptical. If it seems too good to be true, then it may be too good to be true. So And that's the best advice there. It is. You got to really think about it. I just got this job and this person is going to send me all this money just to deposit into my account. It's the easiest job I've ever had and I'm getting paid. Is it too good to be true? Most likely it is. Yeah. And particularly they're sending it by check, but then they want me to send something by e-transfer or something just just seems out of whack here. So, well, that's very good advice. And I think that's a great way to start off Fraud Prevention Month because, I mean, and I'm stunned by that number. You said 77 million e-transfers in the month of December, and maybe that was a slightly higher number because it was Christmas month. But if I'm not mistaken, there's only like 35 million people in Canada. So that means the average human being did a couple of e-transfers. And probably the one-year-olds amongst us are not doing a lot of e-transfers. So that means adults are probably doing three or four each a month. That's a that's a pretty huge number. So the more we know about it, the the better. Are there any resources you would like to point people to for Fraud Prevention Month? Is there, you know, something on your website, any any other information you'd like to direct people to? Absolutely. They can go to interact.ca for additional information. 
they can go to their financial institution's website, which has a lot of information posted on how to protect yourself. And then there's the Canadian Centre of Anti-Fraud, uh, that they can go to the link, which is an RCMP link with lots of tips and all the latest scams uh, that's happening. Excellent. So I'm going to put links to all of that in the show notes on YouTube. So for everybody who's listening on the podcast, you can check your podcast app. I'll put the links there too, or go to YouTube and we'll have all these links. I think it's a good idea, certainly once a year, to do a little bit of an audit of yourself. Okay, when was the last time I did change my password? Are there new security things like auto deposit that I wasn't even aware of? Why not set them up now? Sounds like a good opportunity to do it. Rachel, thank you very much for being here. I very much appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Thank you. That is our show for today. Thanks for listening. I think we covered a lot of very practical things that people can do to prevent fraud from happening. Auto deposit being a pretty obvious one and being skeptical being the, the other one. If someone's sending you money that doesn't normally send you money, that just is not the kind of thing that happens. So I think great advice for all of us. As I said, links to everything we talked about today are on YouTube. Please like and subscribe. It helps get the word out. Thanks for listening. Until next week, I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30. <laughs>